Greetings once again to our dwarven brothers out there in the galaxy. Today we deadass cooking up something for your viewing pleasure. You've seen the gang, and you've seen the ops. However, we will be going into as much detail as possible in regards to Hoxus' backstory, the projects of Hoxus, and the history of DRG, including their struggles and triumphs. Yes, and the first order of business out of everything we are covering today is going to be the regions of Hoxus. We will start off with the most basic of the regions, the Salt Pits. This region, allegedly, used to be a giant lake that dried up many billions of years ago and resulted in the formation of vast caverns of salt formations and crystals. According to the crew, the salt from this region is really good when applied to glyphid omelets. The salt pits is also the breeding ground for the Kornar, since their shell development depends highly on sodium. This development is important due to the fact that it allows them to grow spikes to pile drive them straight into someone's nuts. Oh, and there are occasional stalagmites that will kill just about anything they fall onto. Now, theoretically, if you built a battle dome and put sewn together quinars in it, you could have Beyblade battles. What? You heard me. Anyways, up next we have the Sand Blasted Corridors region. One of the least dense regions having walls smoother and softer than Steve the Glyphid when you take him up to the space rig after a mission. And put a little bit of lipstick on him. Somehow, this place produces sandstorms and fucking wind tunnels, it is the closest region to the surface, being only half a non-freedom unit underground. The wind is also somehow extremely strong, blowing through each of these tunnels that reach dozens of miles underground. There is also a shark in this area, with specialized spines to dig through the sandstone with ease, and at high speeds. Furthermore, the sandstorms somehow create fossilized creatures and trees over time. And now that we are done talking about the silly underground desert, we are going to move on to the crystalline caverns. The main thing about this place is the fact that it has worthless crystals, much like the salt pits. However, these crystals glow and provide light, which is quite nice. However, there is one big downside. Many of these glowing crystals are expelling massive amounts of electricity that can be lethal to dwarf, bug, and machine alike. So unless you find the Spider-Man villain, Electro, really hot, this is a terrible place to be. Now, while this place is considered one of the most breathtaking regions within the Hoxies, it is also one of the hardest to dig through. Dwarves will spend significantly more time digging around to gather materials and precious minerals to meet their quotas. There are no plants here, however leaving merely spider webs and rocks. Speaking of rocks, make sure to watch out for those electro crystals. They may look like regular blue growing crystals, but they are certainly not. They will attempt to do the 1980 surgery of shock the gay away on you whether you're straight or not. When being near said crystals, they will slow you down while constantly shooting electric charge into nearby targets. That, of course, unless the nearby targets leave the arcing range. Or the targets have a rubber bondage suit underneath their armor. As a last note of these caverns, they are seemingly directly above the magma core region. Having rock smokestacks scattered all over to relieve some of the built-up pressure from the magma. Oh, and we also have the wall eyes. Organic little purple bits that will constantly stare at you. We don't know what their purpose is or what they serve, much like the cave vine. But, as far as we know, killing them has no adverse effects. So make sure to kill as many as possible. And now that we are done covering the bedazzled caverns, we are going to move on to a much more horrific region of the planet. That being the fungus bogs. In the words of management... We're almost sorry to send employees here, but the rewards are too great to ignore. So therefore, welcome to the Fungus Bogs. A truly awful region built mostly from slime, mold, stinging insects, fungus, stinky mud, and corrosive lichen. Now, I heard this was Carl's favorite biome. And I also heard that he was a fun guy. Get it? Stickier than your parents' bedroom on a Friday night, the fungus bogs are filled with massive amounts of hazards, 
from steam geysers launching dwarves into the air to sticky slime, getting dwarves stuck in the middle of combat against swarms of enemies. There are even toxins spewed from plants that will rock the sturdiest of dwarves. This is one of the most frustrating regions to do missions on in Hoxus, as there is no method of getting around other than slow and steady. Now, I'd say something interesting about this godforsaken place, but there is nothing but death and slowness here. It just sucks, and drags on and on, and is as inevitable as taxes. And now, down to where Hulk likes to get a little freaky. The Radioactive Exclusion Zone. Ravaged by thousands of years of high-intensity gamma radiation orgies, this region of the planet is now a veritable hellhole of radioactive ash and decrepit mutant flora. It's a place to move very carefully within, and make sure to get your complimentary chemotherapy on the way out. As glyphids seem to be the most resilient of bastards, instead of falling to pieces, they have somehow adapted to and harnessed the power of the radiation within the area. This makes them far more resistant to radiation and causes some of them to explode in radioactive clouds when dying. As a small upside, though, they do glow in the dark. So if you catch a swarmer in a butterfly net, you'll have an infinite portable flare. Despite that, though, the radiation seems to be so strong that gray tumors within green spots have embedded themselves into the cave walls throughout the region. Although with that, we do have our fan favorite wall eyes appearing in this region as well. Let it be noted that dwarves are not as resistant to radiation as the bugs are, so the massive veins of volatile uranium spread around the caves are extremely detrimental for dwarves to stand anywhere close to, unless you want a third nipple or a fourth arm growing out of either of your sides. Now on to your brother, whose eyes are a little too far apart. We're going to cover a zone he has something in common with, the dense biozone. This is a region of Hoxies that proves plants do not need sunlight to survive. This place is a subterranean rainforest filled with masses of mostly carnivorous plant life somehow living deep within the planet's crust. And despite being so deep inside the crust, it has been proven to rain down in this region. So there are holes from the surface that lead all the way down here somehow. Now, the types of plants that will make this zone popular are, as such, the elevator plants that, when stepped on, will move dwarves up and down on its big-ass leaf. The light blue exploder plants, of course. Everyone loves those. The ejector cacti that will launch spikes in all direction. Everyone loves those as well, just not as much as the exploder plants. The cave urchins that work exactly like sea urchins, a spiky plant that prays for you to step on them. <laughs> Lastly, one of the more important ones... The Trapodactis, an egg-shaped plant that will shoot spikes out of each small hole around it when attacked. Moving away from the nice vegetation, let's go somewhere a bit colder. Over to the glacial strata we go. It is said by at least one of the xenologists working on studying Hoxus that had tendered his resignation in rage when finding out that the planet did not have any conventional polar ice caps, but instead, in violation of all laws of physics as we know them, Hoxus decided to rest on top of a planet-wide permafrost layer, several miles deep underground. As usual, though, DRG enacts a don't-ask approach when it comes to the makeup of Hoxus and its regions. This is no exception. Reaching temperatures that can freeze a dwarf solid, the glacial region has many different hazards that can leave even the strongest of dwarves on their knees, begging for some hot chocolate and a blankie. Things such as a cryofomer and cryobulbs, both holding large amounts of liquid nitrogen type fluid that will rapidly reduce a dwarf's temperature. There are also things such as cold vents, which are giant cracks in the wall that will freeze anything that comes anywhere near them. There is also smooth ice which refuses to follow any conventional law of friction, making not sliding impossible. On the more dangerous side of things, we have giant ice stalagmites which will fall and cause a large explosion when hitting the ground, as well as a really deep snow that will slow anyone down. 
We also have random blizzards in this already extremely icy area. And lastly, crevice cracks. These will, upon stepping on one of these cracks, drop you into a very deep hole that weirdly usually has platforms making it relatively easy to get out of. Just like Taylor Swift, we're going to go from cold to hot. We have the Magma Core region, the deepest of any of the other regions that we've gone in within the planet possibly including deep dives, of course. These caves are said to sit at a mellow 250 to 450 degrees Fahrenheit. DRG advises dwarves not to touch anything outside of the mandated mission objective while visiting this place, as your employee insurance does not cover burns. The most common hazard in this area will be extremely hot rocks causing burning through your armor, mind you, upon contact, and lava geysers shooting out pillars of fire. And if you destroy any of these geysers, they will deal a massive amount of damage to everything, including the terrain, leaving lots of hot rock behind it. Occasionally, earthquakes can happen in this area, exposing large crevices of magma rock, Otherwise, there are only two types of shit that are being used as a yellow tube and a chrome puff, both of which being worth no money so you don't have to worry about them. What you should be worrying about is the fact that because of these awful conditions, you are more likely to see some hard-hitting glyphids, as they seem to be the only ones able to survive the heat. Last and definitely least, this is a vegan's nightmare. The Hollow Bow region. This place is quite the biological oddity that has the science department constantly scratching their heads. It is a section of the planet that seems to be dominated by a colossal organic conglomeration resembling hollow trees. These structures seem to be under attack by an invasive species of voracious vine-like plants that seem to be as big of a threat to local wildlife as it is to most dwarves. Seeming to be a dying ecosystem, there are many remnants of plants. Plants that seem to be dying, or have already died off in the area. Things such as tumbleweeds, giant acorns growing from the ceiling, thorny plants called the thorn pot, different types of vines and other plant life that likes to crawl along the walls, and even things called the corpse feeders. Things that behave like magnets when dwarves appear. Onto the parasites. We have the creeper vine that, upon contact, will stab into any nearby invader and will quickly retract into walls when damaged. There is the bloated vine as well, which is much bigger and covered in thorns. Lastly, we have the wasp nests and stabber vines to go over. The wasp nests being self-explanatory, but the stabber vines being stationary creatures that will attempt to attack anything that comes within its kill range, though they can be easily destroyed. Next up, we have the history of the planet to go over. We do not have much on paper, but what we do know is that Hoxus was once a forbidden, abandoned planet in a distant star system. It was DRG who decided it was time to risk life and limb, not their own, of course, to plunder the numerous resources and valuables hidden within the planet. It's beyond anyone's knowledge how they found a seemingly endless supply of half-brain-dead psychopaths willing to work for mostly booze, bacon, and armor paint, a group of people that are not only willing to venture onto the planet once or twice, but are willing to continuously do this job, all throughout the earthquakes, the gravity anomalies, extreme temperatures, and complete lack of safety procedures or just lack of safety in general, to be completely honest here. There is one spot within Hoxies that is relatively safe compared to most other areas. That is the Shallow Grotto, which seems to be a training spot for any new Greenbeards. A region that doesn't contain any crafting materials and only has an abundance of Morkite and gold with a little bit of Nitro. That is besides the point, however, for we are here to discuss history. What better place to start than the early days of DRG employment within the Hoxie system? Now, when the company first arrived, there was not much going on within the planet at the time. They arrived, established operations, and hired as many dwarves as they could in mass to prepare for the future. 
Yes, yes, there was not much going on until the rival presence was discovered and began growing exponentially over time. Deep Rock's management decided it was time to do something about the rival presence. As, of course, they were potentially strong competition. The rivals sent out dozens of fully automated scout ships, complete with construction robots and hectotons of building material. Uh, okay, what the fuck is a hectoton? Hang on. No, no, I, I refuse to believe that's a word. I didn't even know that existed. I hate languages so much. It just means a hundred tons. Just say hundreds of tons, Jesus Christ. Anyway, carrying on about the rivals, they scared DRG to such a massive extent that four new weapon contracts were bought, one of each for each main class of dwarf on board the space rig, from the Loki smart rifle to the corrosive sludge pump. As soon as the robots had landed on Hoxus, a promise was made that they would do everything they could to uproot these other invaders. All of this in the name of Hoxus itself and the name of Prophet. The dwarves were able to conduct many different missions, destroying, hacking, and generally sabotaging any rival operations. Yes, and the main missions fending off the robots started out as finding the corporation's data vaults. These required taking down the caretaker after hacking multiple different points to take down their force fields. After the caretaker is dispatched, DRG was able to get their hands on the rival corps' encrypted data racks. Despite sabotaging many robots, blowing up many caretakers, and rival prospectors, the information that was gathered did not help quickly push out the rival incursion. It would take multiple months before the war would start coming to its climactic conclusion. Skipping forward to this conclusion... We got to the point where the rivals were now the ones innovating on weapons technology to fend off dwarves specifically. On top of all of the normal variants of robots we went over in the last video, you know, your turrets, you got your shredders, your patrol bots, etc. We now have the Nemesis, a robot specifically designed to kill dwarves. In the end, and possibly with the help of gaining four more weapons, this time being secondaries, Despite having to dodge now pre-established tourist nests all around Hoxies as well as rival signatures which can dish out lethal blasts of energy. Eventually the rivals started to fall back, not completely because of their seemingly infinite resources. They seem to be a threat that will always be at least somewhat lingering in the background of DRG's operations. After the rival incursion, a much bigger threat appeared, the Rock Pox Comet. This comet shed hundreds of meteorites which contained the rock pox infection, and even destroyed one of the space rigs on its way towards the surface of Hoxus. They had just made the dwarves' jobs a little more tedious, as not only would they have to complete their main mining objectives, they would now have to deal with rock pox nodes. There was also a slew of larvae and other infested enemies now in combat. Some meteorites would also burrow deep into the planet and require special cleansing tools, where dwarves would have to apply foam to the affected areas and use a strong vacuum to suck up the rock spox. Fearing the inevitable further spread and horrific mutations, the dwarves were given a new type of grenade for each different class. Just like with the robots, the dwarves did all they could, killing any and all infected, and cleansing as many meteoroids as possible. In retaliation, the infection continued to get worse. In the coming months, we would get even more variants of infected glyphids. We would also get outright mutations of glyphids that would become a permanent addition to the ecosystem. During these trying times, the only thing that was given was a very rare chance to find some jetty boots on a mission. Somehow, both Hoxies and DRG was able to hold out until the Rockpox Comet had passed, eradicating any and all traces of the disease. It left management with a clear head and greatly helped the scientists working for DRG to have a riveting breakthrough. It was found out that deeper towards the core of Hoxies was a special material, that being more kite seeds. Using a telemetric rangefinder and a drill evader, the dwarves are now able to pinpoint the Morkite geodes in order to crack them open and bring the seeds back to management. 
These seeds are so widely sought after because they may allow Morkite to be grown on any planet, boosting profits massively and giving management a huge hard-on. As a way of the planet reacting to this discovery, multiple new types of sentient plants and glyphids started appearing. This, along with areas even harder, breaking the previous record of hazard level, we have gone from five to now five plus. There are now also reports of a new material formation, the core stone. This can seemingly open rifts to other dimensions or locations in order to help defend it. These creatures that come to the stone's aid are called core spawn crawlers. After killing enough of them and freeing the core stone from its obsidian looking cast, it will go into a dormant state and is able to be extracted in a special pod. Following the trend of every previous event, things are sure to get worse from here. But as things go, this is the end of the story as of filming this video. If you've made it this far, message down in the comments what's your favorite Glyphid. Be seeing you in the future and have fun mining.